Um, yeah, so welcome sure. everyone and um, thanks for coming to the presentations for the Momentum Fellows. Like, uh, so both Matt and Mohammed have been working really hard for the past eight weeks, I think, and um, have done some really great work. So it'll be really interesting to see their final presentations. So Matt was gonna speak first. Sure, sounds good. Good morning, everyone. All right. Sure, so just a, a quick background. I'm a incoming PhD student into uh, Columbia's engineering program this fall. Spent the summer working with Kara and Carl. Um, been a great time working on the prediction of aerosol optical properties with graph machine learning. Uh, specifically, what we've been working on is predicting the optical properties of black carbon. Uh, so black carbon is a atmospheric aerosol. It is a dark in color, also known as soot, uh, and it's a light absorbing aerosol. The issue with that is it heats the atmosphere and also darkens surfaces, for example, snow and ice, uh, which in turn heat them. Uh, it's the result of incomplete combustion, uh, and it's one of the larger climate forcing aerosols in the atmosphere. Uh, the issue with uh, the reason that we're interested in this particle, this aerosol in particular, is that uh, its life cycle is relatively uncertain. Uh, and additionally, it's pretty com pretty computationally expensive to fully model uh, the optical properties of this aerosol. <laughs> so one of the simpler methods of doing uh, optical parameter approximation is something called mean scattering theory. This would be essentially modeling this entire aerosol aggregate as a sphere, uh, and then uh, analytically computing the scattering properties off of that. Uh, more complex methods such as MSTM, multi-sphere T-matrix, uh, these represent the aerosol as an aggregate of particles uh, in space. Uh, but the issue with that is that they're more computationally expensive, uh, prohibitively so, especially for larger aggregates. Uh, that are present in the atmosphere. To make things more complicated, uh, these particles can also be bare or coated. Uh, for this project, we focus solely on the bare particles. Uh, the introduction of coatings on these aerosols add lensing effects to the aggregates, meaning that the light can uh, increase in intensity as it bends through the coating, for example, water on the particle. And additionally, it will create um, something called necking effects between the, the, aggregate, the particles in the aggregate. Uh, so for example, uh, they will, the surface tension of the water between two nodes in the aerosol uh, can connect and basically add more lensing effects to it. So for that reason, so far we focus on the bare aggregates, uh, but oh, the nonetheless, Was that a question? All right. Uh, yeah, nonetheless, even the modeling of bare aggregates for uh, larger aggregates uh, is computationally expensive. So some methods have been uh, undertaken to improve the computational efficiency of this, namely, uh, as seen in other fields, using uh, machine learning methods for reduction of these computationally expensive tasks similar to people to what people do for example, for example, computational fluid dynamics. Uh, so path, past methods for uh, this type of problem have included support vector machines or simple MLPs. These perform generally well, uh, but struggle to generalize beyond the training set that they're trained on. So what you're seeing here on the right is uh, a model that has been trained on lower complexity aggregates. Uh, so one representation of the complexity of an aggregate is the fractal dimension. Uh, so on the x-axis, uh, what you're seeing is as the size of the aggregate increases, uh, the model performance degrades as we no longer see those samples in the training set. Uh, whereas MSTM, the more analytical solver shown as the scatter points on the plot, uh, continues to show the true trend. 
one common approach that people have taken in other physical science domains would be representing this type of data as a graph. So as you may have noticed, the aggregate has an inherent structure to it, a physical structure with positions and space. So for example, with a, a molecule, you do this with atoms and the bonds between them representing the edges. Uh, similarly, uh, what we would do in our case will, would be we would represent the aggregate as nodes, which would have the characteristic properties of black carbon and then edges representing the uh, relative distance between each node in that aggregate. Uh, for us, we're using characteristic length as the edge property between these uh, nodes in the aggregate. Uh, and as the complexity of the aggregate increases, again, this is represented by the fractal dimension DF, uh, the density of the adjacency matrix for this graph will increase. And why might this be interesting? Uh, one method that has taken off in this field, for example, in drug discovery or other graph-based uh, representations of physical uh, items would be use the usage of graph neural networks. Uh, so for these, again, we have a, a relative representation of all of the nodes and for all of the items within this aggregate. And on top of this, we can essentially learn the spatial relationship between all of them, similar to how a convolutional neural network work for pixels and an image-based task. There are a couple different flavors of graph neural networks that people have played around with. Uh, most commonly uh, these days would be a message passing based network. Uh, and that's what we explored in uh, this work. Some nice properties of graph neural networks that we can take advantage in this task would be uh, first invariance. Basically what this means is that uh, we have for a given aggregate of particles, uh, whether we apply a transform to it or not in uh, three dimensions, we should have the same output regardless of the orientation of that particle of, the, of that aggregate. In addition, we have equivariance, uh, meaning that for the, the transform that is applied on the aggregate by our graph network, uh, whether we apply an additional 3D transformation to the output of our network or to the input of our network, the output should be the same. Uh, these are nice because they introduce, uh, like they say, invariance and equivariance uh, to variations and permutations in the input, meaning that uh, no matter the orientation or order of your input, we get the same output from our model. Uh, basically meaning that the uh, orientation should not matter uh, for our graph network, which have the same outputs. As a whole pipeline, again, what we're trying to do is reduce the comp computational complexity of the modeling of these optical parameters. Uh, again, one of the common methods for modeling these analytically would be MSTM, multi-sphere T-matrix. Uh, in our regime, we are instead trying to train a network in a supervised manner to mimic the performance of MSTM. In doing so, we have a couple of baselines that we compare against. Uh, some of the weaker baselines, again, are uh, me theory and really scattering theory. Uh, these are um, pure like solutions to Maxwell's equations, uh, and then slightly stronger baselines that we're comparing against are a multi-layer perceptron like prior works, uh, and in addition, a, a vanilla message passing neural network and an equivariant neural equivariant graph neural network. The difference between the last two is that uh, in a message passing neural network, uh, we have a transformational invariance as well as positional encoding in our input and represented within our graph network. Whereas in our equivariant message passing neural network, we incorporate the uh, positional transformation within the network. So the message passing network is only invariant to our permutations in our input, whereas the equivariant network is both invariant and equivariant. And in this task, we are interested in how uh, the performance of this network 
again, can expand beyond just our training set and perform for uh, unseen examples in the zero shot evaluation case. So what you're seeing here on the right is uh, our target model, the equivariant neural network, uh, which we believe to be the best candidate for this task uh, compared with the multilayer perceptron baseline on the left. Uh, as you see, for the four principal optical parameters, we have extinction, absorption, scattering, and the asymmetry parameter. Uh, the equivariant network outperforms on all of them for these. Uh, so these graphs are uh, x or y equals x would be the perfect solution here. We're predicting true value on the x and y axis respectively. Um, and additionally to that, as compared to the uh, message passing neural network, again, we see uh, improved performance with the incorporation of equivariance into our graph neural network. Further, one thing that we are interested in is what learning what these networks actually attenuate to. Uh, so on the left here, you're seeing a raw aggregate and the graph developed for that aggregate. Uh, and for each of these, we're seeing the saliency maps for the respective networks that were uh, represented here in this work. Um, so one thing that's interesting is uh, basically the, the concentration of attention being spread or concentrated to certain areas within the aggregate, uh, noticing that, for example, the equivariant network, uh, the attention of it is spread more evenly throughout. Further, one quantitative metric for evaluating the performance of uh, these different baselines is the absolute percentage error between the true value and the predicted value um, for each of these baselines. Uh, so again, we have Rayleigh, me, uh, multilayer perceptron, message passing, and equivariant neural networks, uh, where the mean absolute percentage error is the uh, difference between the predicted ground truth uh, summed over all the samples. Uh, as we notice, again, as expected, equivariance introduces a a large performance gain, especially compared to the weaker baselines here, uh, in all parameters that we are interested in looking at, uh, extinction, absorption, scattering, and asymmetry. Uh, all of these, which are parameters that affect the, um, the, the light scatter, or the scattering of the aggregate. So in this work, uh, one thing that we were interested in doing is basically finding a way to speed up the prediction of optical properties for these aggregates compared to uh, analytical methods such as multi-sphere T-matrix or uh, me theory. Um, we're successful in doing so as the models are able to perform inference in under 300 milliseconds, as well as seeing the inductive bias of the node level the no level inductive bias of each of the graph neural networks and ability to generalize beyond the seen training data into larger aggregates. Uh, and one thing that we, we found to be very important in this would be the equivariance of the uh, graph network opposed to simply invariance. Uh, we have two potential forward avenues with this work. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier that there is difficulty in modeling the life, si life cycle of the uh, aggregates in the atmosphere. Uh, one method of doing that is called particle Monte Carlo. It is a simulation for uh, atmospheric aerosols. Uh, within this, there is a, a mean scattering theory approximation used for uh, the prediction of the optical parameters. Uh, one thing that would be an improvement to uh, this type of simulation would be uh, using a method like this, which simulates a more complex solution to the optical parameters um, as a way to better model the life cycle of black carbon. An additional avenue would be 
the incorporation of coded aggregates. So this was all based on bare aggregates, which do not have uh, condensation around them. Uh, to improve the overall accuracy of this and utility in real, real uh, evaluations of atmospheric aerosols. Uh, there are two approaches to doing this, generating uh, more training data that involve code aggregates or the exploration of a transfer, le transfer learning of this type of uh, network to uh, data sets that are representative of coded aggregates. And I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Um, and I will open it up. It looks like Caitlin maybe has a question. Yeah, very um, interesting work, Matt. I'm wondering if you could maybe go back to those like model saliency maps and explain like what exactly you're showing and if this can give us like some physical interpretation of what the machine learning is tell telling us. Sure. So this is uh, basically just a uh, relative uh, visualization of where the uh, it's through an algorithm called visual backpropagation, which uh, shows the relative magnitude of the gradients for each of the nodes in the graph. Um, generally, in the past, this has been used more as a qualitative uh, intuition around your data and how your model is performing on your data. For example, uh, for uh, Image-based tasks, visual back, back propagation will be used, for example, to identify which features contribute most to a certain classification or, um, you know, regression target. Uh, here, uh, it's a little bit less clear uh, what the physical intuition would be. Um, right now, uh, my intuition is that this is more just representing where the, well, one, like the uh, contribution, of course, of which nodes in the graph to the end regression target, uh, which is the output of visual back, back propagation. Um, but yeah, I think the, the intuition here is that, uh, that, Basically, like whether it is, well, I'm not, I'm not too sure on like the physical intuition in the, the aerosol space beyond just where the, the gradients are lying. So an area to explore for sure. This is more of a, a qualitative visualization and uh, hand wavy in terms of quantitative conclusions that are being made around it. All right. Any other questions or? Okay, well, um, let's thank Matt, who took on a, I think, very difficult project of learning both, you know, all of a lot of details about aerosol optics, and as well as the uh, complexity of learning about um, some of the graph-based methods. So I think that's really, really nice work from Matt.